Thank you so much for coming out today and giving us some time in your life to... Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, so, to begin, uh, I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of introduce yourself, who you are and what you're about. Well, I'm a professor of science and religion um, at St. Joseph's College in the University of Alberta. And for nearly the last 20 years, I've been doing introductory courses on how to relate science and faith. Because most people assume that you're either on the scientific side or the religious side, but you can't be both. And when it comes to my university training, I'm trained both in theology and in science. Right. And so you've, you've claimed yourself as an evolutionary creationist. Um, is, yeah, yes. that's, that's a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? Yeah. Because most people assume that if you're an evolutionist, you have to be like Richard Dawkins, mm -hmm. and you have to be an atheist. Uh, inversely, if you're going to claim to be a creationist, you assume the world was created in six literal days. Now, this term evolutionary creation has come out, I'd say, roughly the last 15 or so years. And the way it's structured, we always talk in grammar about the substantive, which is the noun, which in the case of evolutionary creation is the word creation. An evolutionary creationist, like myself, is first and foremost someone who believes in a creator. So that makes me a creationist. Now the adjective evolutionary just happens to be the way we think God created the world. He worked through an evolutionary process. It would be his process, ordained, he planned it, and sustained, he upholds it all the way through evolutionary time. So an evolutionary creation is someone who's definitely a Christian and also believes uh, in a God who uses an evolutionary process. Awesome. Okay. So your name has Dennis Lamaru in it, but it also has lots more letters after that. Yeah, lots of spaghetti letters. <laughs> so if you, want, if you don't mind just diving into a quick um, personal story, what's brought you to this point? And, uh... Well, I think we have to rewind the tape all the way back to, say, 1972. Uh, I came out of a good uh, French-Canadian Roman Catholic boys' school, Collège Saint-Jean, and I remember in the 11th grade when the issue of evolution first came up, my hockey coach, uh, who was also my biology teacher, uh, Mr. Bouchard, man of wonderful faith, said to us, we don't have to choose between evolution and creation. We could see evolution as being God's way of creating the world. Now, today I will say, okay, that's true. I believe that's true. But if you tell a kid in grade 11 or 16 years of age, and that's all you tell them that, that's just not enough. You mm -hmm. need to know more. Because if you're not equipped and you go to a public university like I did, and I came to the University of Alberta, wonderful university, the very first course in biology in those days was Biology 296, which was entirely an evolution. By the time Christmas came along, I was no longer going to church, and basically religion was done in my life. Um, my parents hauled me in at Christmas time to ask me why, and you know, my parents, wonderful parents, but didn't have the privilege of university, so they couldn't really respond to my scientific arguments, and I was the first kid in the whole Lamru clan to go to university, so there wasn't an uncle or an aunt or a cousin who could help me out with this issue. Basically, I was cut free, if you wish, intellectually. And by the end of my first year of university, and I've held a, written a diary ever since that time, um, there's a passage and it basically says, you know, the more I study evolutionary biology, the more it seems that humans are nothing but molecules, but then I go dot, dot, dot. There must be something more. So I didn't go all the way to atheism, but traditional religion was definitely off the table. We use the term today spiritual, but not religious. I suppose I was in that sort of realm. Went on to the University of Alberta Dental School, and between my third and fourth year, back to my diary, I write in it, this is 1977, uh, love, love is nothing but a herd response. So i am gone all the way, talk about the slippery slope, Christians are worried about that, going to public mm -hmm. universities, I understand that. So by 77, I, uh, I, I completely embrace an atheistic view of the world. Um, it doesn't take much imagination to think, and I'm not proud of this, how I treated women. If love is nothing but a herd response, love really doesn't exist. We're nothing but animals and heat, and that was basically my perspective and worldview. Military paid my way through dental school and went on to a posting in Nicosia, Cyprus, which was United Nations peacekeeper. I was the dentist for a regiment. It was there that you know I rekindled my faith, and yeah, it's right here. 
Gospel of John. Uh, started reading the Gospel of John and just started doing these things in my heart. Just have a deep sense that this is true. And so it was during that six month tour, you know, I came to Christ. And uh, but there is a there's a problem in all this. If you sort of know this from the very beginning, I'm trapped in a dichotomy. Right. That either or approach to things. Now I come to Christ. I'm still trapped in a dichotomy, and I work with the assumption I'm having a power. I mean, it's a powerful religious exper- conversion. I mean, there's no doubt there's a conversion going on, but I can only pick A or B. So the move away from evolution was an easy one. That if I have to be a Christian, I have to be a six day creationist. Came back to Canada and ended up in a really good evangelical church in Calgary. It was an Alliance Church, First Alliance. Glenmore Trail, and I mean, great love for the scriptures, but it's there I get exposed to a lot of young earth creationists, and that sort of filled the void for me in terms of how do you make sense of origins, and um, by the time I came to the end of my military commitment, I uh, just had a real sense of calling that um, my calling was to go attack evolutionists in all universities, <laughs> and I went on to graduate school to, uh, to do that, and it was a, a two-part graduate education. I started off first at Regent College. I mean, my, my first thought is go to the Institute of Creation Research, become a creation scientist, then go declare war, jihad, if you wish, on all university professors who teach evolution. But the Lord had something in mind. Um, he started me off at Regent College, which is in Vancouver. It's a wonderful evangelical uh, school, graduate school. Oh, and I fought like mad with my professors, but... Part of the problem was I was reading the scriptures like I was reading my science books, like I was reading my dental journals. And reading an ancient text is a little more complicated than, say, what we learn in Sunday school. God bless the Sunday school teachers. Yes. <laughs> so over three and a half years at Regent, it became clear to me that uh, what we see in scripture is definitely the word of God. But when the Holy Spirit inspired the biblical writers... He respected their intellectual milieu, in other words, their context, and used their ancient conceptuality of nature. Uh, The big idea was to say, I created the whole world, but he accommodated to their level. And so that was a huge first step for me. After Regent, so at that point, I left Young Earth Creationism, and it always sounds shocking when I say it. I left Young Earth Creationism for biblical reasons, simply because... (laughs) There's an ancient conceptuality in scripture, which we tend not to be taught in Sunday school. Mm-hmm. Went on to the University of Toronto to do a PhD in that first generation of evangelicals right after Darwin. And of course, the thought is, well, they were all against evolution. Well, here's the sh- second shock of my life. No, evangelicals in the first 50 years, and in particular, I studied the Princetonians, had no trouble with evolution so long as it was an ordained and sustained evolutionary process. And one of the great arguments, and in fact, I also studied Darwin. It's in Darwin's Origin of Species, was an analogy between development in the womb, embryology, and, and evolution. And they were arguing like this. They're saying, look, at, we don't know of any Christians who believe the Lord comes out of heaven to attach an arm or attach a leg. No, we sort of think of Psalm 139, whereby the Lord knit us together, fearfully and wonderfully made in our mother's womb. So in other words, the Lord uses natural processes. Well, if the Lord uses natural processes to create each and every one of us, well, why can't there be another set of natural processes? We call these evolutionary processes, that they're indeed the Lord's processes, and it's through this process everything gets created, including human beings. So I came away from that PhD uh, ready to accept evolution, but I still was a skeptic of evolution. Now, It's back to my knees. I mean, every time I make a major move, like enter a program, it's always on my knees. And as you as you grow in your faith, you get a sense of discernment where God's calling you. And the Lord basically said to me, "Okay, look, at you could probably start teaching now, but really, Dennis, how much science do you know?" And well, I was a clinician; I could fix your teeth, but I was not an evolutionary biologist. Far from it. Mm -hmm. But because I had a tooth background. I could end up in a PhD in evolutionary biology of some of the very best evidence, the evolution of teeth and jaws. Right. So that's exactly what I did. I got into the program, and I went into the program with the intention of going under the radar and collecting data to present the most blasphemous attack in evolutionary biology. I do my PhD with integrity. You can always find, uh, you can always find a project that you and your supervisor can agree. For example, in theology, the reason I went to the University of Toronto is I wanted to get out of the household of faith to work with an atheist. And I worked with an atheist and they found the topic. So 
here I am back at Edmonton, but I have a deep agenda. And well, what happened? I started seeing some of the evolutionary evidence. I tried stuffing it into an anti-evolutionary model, but eventually the evidence continually mounted. And after three and a half years, I was like the little boy at the dike. You know, you're trying to block the evolutionary evidence <laughs> to finally put your hands up in the air and say what just about anyone who's actually studied evolutionary biology. I'm not talking about people who've never studied have an opinion. I'm talking about people who've actually studied evolutionary biology. And we all walk away with this one word, overwhelming. Mm -hmm. The evidence for evolution is overwhelming. There are no other scientific competing theories, though, of course, within my evangelical tradition, some people say there are, but they're not. And if you have a look at who, make the, who makes these theories, most of them are people with no training in science. So after three and a half years of, like I said, seeing the day to day and day out, put my hands up in the air and say, well, there you go. It's another thing I learned in Sunday school that wasn't true. You know, mm -hmm. There is evidence for evolution. Now, I did not lose a step in my walk of faith or my love with, to Jesus or in particular the scriptures because I'd done most of that theological thinking before. And so the moment I accepted evolution, it was, it was, it was no problem at all because mm -hmm. I knew what the move was. You don't go to scripture and use it as a scientific textbook. The scripture reveals deep spiritual truths, inerrant spiritual truths to change our lives. So in that regard, um, so that was 1994, I made that move and started teaching in 97 and been working in that area ever since. Hmm. Awesome. So even with a story like that presented to a lot of people, um, once they face someone with a degree in theology and a degree in, in evolutionary biology, it's still something that's really difficult to swallow. So why, why is that that this is our general societal well, can we use view. this slide here? And I think the slide says it all. Definitely. We are socially conditioned. I don't like using the B word, but it's thrown out in these discussions. We're brainwashed into a dichotomy. And that's not just secular society. That's also the church doing that to their young people. Mm -hmm. And I know this because I teach those young people. And they are completely entrenched. And a dichotomy, dika in Greek, means two, and temno means to cut. They take an issue and they cut it into two simple positions, A or B, black or white. So what you'll notice in this slide in the dichotomy, you're on the so-called, and notice my quotation marks, the so-called evolution science side, and there's no place for God, or you're on the creation in six days religion God side, and there's no place mm -hmm. for, for uh, belief in God, so, or, or for evolution. So you have to pick one or the other. And regrettably, here's my question. How about some middle grounds? And there are a lot of us working in this area saying, yeah, there is a middle ground. And it really goes back to the categories and not knowing the options. And if you ask me what's the most important thing I teach my students in my introductory course in the science and religion, is I show them there's a spectrum and they can be freed from picking A or B. And here's the interesting, I teach a lot of students who are in pre-med who have to see the biological evidence when it comes to the evolutionary evidence today, sure, the bones are great. I got convinced on the bones and teeth. But the real evidence right now is evolutionary genetics. And for those students going on to medicine, they have to know the genetics. And they're seeing the evidence right in their very genes. It's like there's a little stamp in every cell saying, you evolved through, you came through an evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. And so the moment I give them their options, um, it, it's a very freeing move for them. Because the only way they can survive, and if they're trapped in a dichotomy, is Sunday mornings on this side, five days a week at the university is on that side, and no one's sort of saying how you can do the both. And I think the biggest part of popularity for Christians for my course is I show them how it's possible that what they're seeing in their laboratories is dead true. Mm -hmm. And of course, their experience to Christ is dead true as well, and it allows them to find a middle ground.